Welcome to Midlife Matters. I'm Marie, and each week I'm joined by my friends Julie and Mindy to talk about all the topics keeping women in the middle years up at night. Today we're talking about pornography and the ways it damages and destroys relationships. We're joined by a friend who shares how her husband's addiction to porn impacted her, her family, and ultimately ended their marriage. Join us as we discuss ways we can support and help women dealing with this issue and how we can talk about the dangers of pornography with our children. Let's get started. Listeners, today we're going to be talking about pornography and specifically about pornography as it relates to marriage. And although many may try to brush looking at pornography off as a normal or everyone does it type of thing, the emotional distance fostered by pornography and cyber sex can often be just as damaging to a relationship as real life infidelity. And both men and women tend to put online sexual activity in the same category as having an affair. The estrangement between spouses brought about by pornography can have tangible consequences as well. When viewing of pornography rises to the level of addiction, 40% of sex addicts lose their spouses, 58% suffer considerable financial losses, and about a third lose their jobs. And Mindy and Julie, there seems to be an epidemic of pornography addiction in our culture. We've kind of wanted to cover this topic on Midlife Matters for a while, but you never really know how to approach it. Right. It, it can be, it's a very sensitive subject and, and really hard to say, um, yeah, we've struggled with it or my best friend has struggled with it. So I've had many friends that this has come up um, in conversations. Mm-hmm. And I think having all raised some teenage boys, we've also just as moms talked about this quite a bit amongst friends over the years. Julie, what has been your thoughts on this topic as we go into it? Well, like Mindy said, I have friends that I've talked to that have revealed that this is an issue in their home. And it doesn't seem to matter whether they're in church or not. It seems to be just across the board. And I think when we first t- talked about wanting to do this topic, we were mainly thinking of it from raising teenagers. Right. But I think we'd all agree that we're long past the point of being able to say, oh, my child will never be exposed to this. Right. We probably could have said that, you know, 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. Maybe, I don't know, like, you know, for a child Mm -hmm. in your home, but that is just not even a possibility anymore. So we just have to think about it in a, in a different way. So because there's such a large pornography addiction within our culture, it's both inside and outside of the church. We have someone with us today. We're going to call her Jane. She's going to share her story and the consequences of her husband's pornography addiction with us. And we just appreciate you coming on so much, Jane, because it's not something that everyone is willing to talk about. And we really learn through the personal experiences of others that can be very valuable to listeners and um, it can be a real teaching tool. So I just appreciate you being willing to come on Midlife Matters today. Thank you so much, Maria. I appreciate y'all having me. Yeah. And I've certainly learned from others who were willing to share their story and open up. I definitely want to offer that. Well, can you start with giving us a little background on your family life? Um, You know, how long you were married, how many children, what your career was? We were married 29 years. So uh, a long time before we ended up being divorced, unfortunately. We had three children two older children who are adults and now have children of their own. And I have one younger who is um, 12 and right at that age, according to statistics, where he's going to first be exposed. Mm, mm -hmm. That must seem very daunting to you. It does. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I, I, I mean, you know, you try to prepare. But then with just the my life experiences around that, it does raise like an extra fear level of what can I do? How sure. can I, how can I protect? And, and the reality is that I can only do so much. I can have conversations, I can, you know, use filters and so on, but he's so much smarter on Mm-hmm. <laughs> on technology than I'll ever be. He could he could get around anything I did if he wanted to. Sure. So the best, you know, the best 
approach is just to um, be forthright and honest and have conversations. Yeah, and just build that relationship and hope that he would trust me if or right. or even or even trust his father. Right. Well, um, I know that you said you were married 29 years. Give us a little background on were you at home during that time? Yes, I was a stay at home mom. I homeschooled my kids. Um, my husband was a pastor. And so I did a lot of um, serving in the church, a lot of leading Bible studies and leading VBS and that kind of thing. Loved all that. I absolutely love serving in ministry and and working with um, women and with children, getting a little past the children age these days. But uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> and, and more with just the working with women ages. I mean, I occasionally had a part-time job here or there, but mostly those years were home and homeschool. Yeah. So you're really living the life that I think traditionally in the secular media, they would say is the least likely to be impacted by pornography. Wife of you a would pastor, think, you know, you like, would think. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. I mean, that was certainly, I, I was totally blown away when, mm-hmm. um, when I found out about my husband's issue. So Jane, can you go back and tell us when and how did you discover that your husband had been looking at pornography? Okay. So we had been married um, about a year. We were uh, in seminary. He was in seminary. I was working, putting him through seminary. And uh, yes, and he came home one day and just uh, confessed to me and said, you know, I need to tell you something. Said something along the lines of, I struggle with pornography. I was in shock. I had no clue. I really thought I had, you know, chosen a very safe mm-hmm. <laughs> person as far as that issue, just like you like you were talking about. Um, statistically, you would look and think, oh, that wouldn't happen there. And I certainly thought that. He said he was a believer. Obviously, he was going into ministry. I, I That was not a concern. It was not on my radar at all. Mm-hmm. And so... So initially finding out was just a huge, huge shock to me. And I really didn't know what to do with that information. I'm curious, Jane, um, how, when he confessed that, um, as the shock is settling, how did that make you feel personally? You'd only been married a year. Can you kind of describe for us those feelings that you had about yourself? Those probably came a little later. Okay. <laughs> um, the initial was just feeling scared, not knowing what to do alone. You know, who, mm-hmm. who do I talk to about this? And especially so many years ago, we we're, right. were in the late 80s. So um, it still feels like a taboo subject in church. So I can right, imagine right. in the late so 80s. It was, a, yeah. it was a very, it was not being talked about like it is right. now. Personally. Yeah, after processing through that, definitely just feeling rejected. Um, mm-hmm. You know, why? Why would you do that? What? Mm-hmm. What's What's wrong with me? Right. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, at that time, was it just like printed magazines that he was doing, or no? There were um, there was cable. Okay. And even though we did not have cable, cable would bleed through. Mm, at like okay. it in the in the wee hours of the morning, mm. you could actually access things that mm. we didn't have on our cable. Okay, and um, which I did not know. Right, I didn't know that <laughs> either. I'm not, I'm not watching. I wasn't watching that in the wee hours of the morning, so I did right. not know that. Then there were there were video rental stores and things like that, and so that okay. was um, a part of it. But yeah, the the internet was not yet a mm-hmm. thing. Well, how did it make you feel about your new marriage? Did you feel like, should we even continue? I I did. That was, I mean, that was one of the thoughts that went through my head was like, what should I do? Should I just, you know, divorce and and move on? And, but I I couldn't, I really couldn't fathom that. I mean, I didn't get married to get divorced, you know? And so after the initial, after the initial shock and fear passed, I 
formulated a plan because that's what I do. I was like, okay, you know, we can beat this. Count, we can get counseling. We can get help. We can, you know, we can do this. And that was the next step. One, he, one thing that would be very encouraging is that he came to you. You didn't discover this. You didn't catch right. him. He came to you. So to me, that would have been a very encouraging sign. Like, we can beat this. We can work together on this. Right, right. Yes. And I definitely thought that was a good sign that he uh, came to me. But once I presented a plan for, <laughs> um, hey, let's completely get rid of cable. You know, let's cut out any route here and let's um, go to the church and see if we can get counseling. And there was a lot of pushback. Suddenly it was like, isn't confessing enough? Right. That was my next question is um, he confessed to you, but he was he willing to then take the next step? Was he saying, I need help or I just really want you to know this? You know, like, right. is it just confessing or is it do I want to fix it? I guess. Right. And I would say at that point, it was definitely more of just um, confessing, just wanting a release of carrying the burden. I mean, maybe he believed that that would be enough, that that would make a huge difference. Yeah, there was definitely pushback against the counseling idea, even though we did go to counseling with our church one time. And it was... Um, from his perspective, a very negative experience. The word, you know, once we walked out and got in the car, his words to me were, I'm never doing that again. So that shut that down. Mm -hmm. Jane, many people I would imagine might try to downplay the seriousness of this. Did you ever feel pressure to just say, well, boys will be boys? Like maybe you were being too critical or to expecting too much. Right. Um, there are people who say that that's definitely a message that our culture sends and that even a lot of believers um, will latch on to or be deceived by, but that was definitely not me. <laughs> I did not feel that way. Um, I came to Christ later in life. And so that really, I don't know, I had a lot of clarity about sin and deception and so on and and knowing that um that porn very much was not okay and yeah that's just a lie from the pit and i it makes me sad for believers who may have been deceived by that reasoning because they're already they've given up the battle and we didn't ask this, um, but this might be a good place for you to say, like, why is it so serious? What did you see that was so serious about it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That is a very good question um, because I learned over the years what was so serious about it. For me, for me personally, it was just very um, damaging to our relationship, damaging to sexual intimacy for sure. I mean, very hard to um, trust in that environment, to really connect in that environment when um, you know that your spouse has basically been viewing mm -hmm. lots of other people mm -hmm. and, and lots of other women. And so it, it definitely made that challenging. So internally for me, that was a big deal. I think, I think we want to believe about sin. Again, we deceive ourselves about all kinds of sins that, that we can do something, whatever it is, like we can separate it somehow. We can put it over here in a box and I'm only going to do that one time, or I'm only going to do that two times and I'm never going to do that again. And it's not really going to affect these other boxes over here. And it's a very compartmentalized approach. Um, only that's really not how life works and that's not how your brain really works. You don't have compartments. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you do have compartments, you tend to split <laughs> personally, mm -hmm. um, as a person, you tend to be divided and not, and not be able to make peace with yourself because what you say you believe and do is different than what you're doing. And the other thing is that the longer you stay in something and the more you do it, the more those patterns are there and the stronger that hold is and the more you 
believe the lies and the more, I mean, it just, it's a downward spiral Mm -hmm. and, and it's, yeah, and can lead to depression and, um, social isolation. And just when you're thinking about a man who is, is consuming porn frequently, pretty much every woman he encounters and sees he's viewing through that filter you know Mm -hmm. he's he's seeing parts and fantasies and and things like that and it's just very detrimental to the whole to his whole psyche and soul Mm -hmm. i think too another reason it would be so damaging is that it's so artificial that eventually reality could never compare. I, I just would think you right. would get to a point where nothing could live up to the artificialness. Yeah, the right. Therapy. Absolutely. It's, mm-hmm. it's true. That's true too. The, the, um, the physical side effect of that. <laughs> yeah. It is a, is a big problem. Um, yeah. Porn, you know, whispers this lie, Hey, you know, you can have this satisfaction, this intimacy that you want on your own terms. And but the minute you take that bait and then act out on it right afterwards, it's, you know, shame and disgust and depression and um, emotional emptiness that leads to isolation and fear and social awkwardness. And, yeah, and eventually long term, uh, as you mentioned in the statistics at the beginning, uh, failing at, at work, failing at relationships, failing at life, just a massive underachievement for the potential of the person. Can you walk us through the steps that you did take after you went to counseling and and you felt like that failed? How did this progress? Once my husband rejected the notion of counseling, I said, okay, um, went along with that. I was not healthy enough in myself to say, whoa, uh, no, no can do, you know, (laughs) I'm out of here or we're going to separate until you can you know, I, I did I knew nothing of boundaries or um or how to process that. And so I just went along with that and just hung on to God. And I just began praying very fervently, you know, that um, my husband would change. And that wasn't happening. So it, what what happened in, in our marriage um was just a pattern, a cyclical pattern. I believe that he would go long periods without acting out. At least that's what he was reporting to me. Mm-hmm. And I I tend to believe that that was true. It, it, it looked like something I would later learn was called binge addict. And he could go a long stretch, but then it was just like diving in fully when and, and repeatedly over and over and over and over and over acting out and, and his behaviors and um and personality did sort of reflect that like there would be time periods that things would seem solid and good and I would be hopeful and then just a lot of gaslighting a lot of craziness a lot of confusion and shortly after that within a week or two a confession Mm -hmm. and the confession was always just the general just the you know I messed up if I ever pressed or asked you know anything it was I was shut down um so it was very very isolating I felt very alone because by by this time we were in ministry he is a pastor I do not know who I can go to Mm -hmm. um I feel like I can't tell anyone at my church, mm-hmm. um, you know, so uh, it was just very, very lonely. I was torn between protecting him, protecting his image and just sanity. Mm-hmm. So, Jane, did you live this, I'll call it pattern of his habitual sin um, and these cycles? Did you live through that for the 29 years you were married? So we had been married about 17 years when um, I was just losing it, mentally breaking down, just not knowing how I was going to go on because I was living this lie, you know, keeping this secret. And it was just 
tearing me apart. Our marriage was very uh, broken and weird at that point. And he came in one evening. He had, he had started uh, going somewhere on Monday night, and I didn't even ask where he went. I was just so done. And he came in after one of those Monday nights and said, I guess you know that I'm going to a support group oh. for sexual addiction. And I said, no, I did not know that. And um, But I still was that did not <laughs> really right. move me um, because, I mean, I had 17 years of the of the cycle right. um, and of promises and 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 so on. And so I, I didn't really believe that that this would bring any change. But within a, in a couple of more weeks, he actually uh, came in and apologized for some past um, behaviors, past relationships with women, that even though they were not affairs, just mm-hmm. emotional, inappropriate. That caught my attention because he had never owned anything like that before. So um, it was soon after that that we had the opportunity to receive some intensive counseling and support groups where he had been attending um, and so we took advantage of that. And for the first time, I was I was very, very hopeful that uh, that things were going to change. And, and he seemed to be changing and to um, and to be open to receiving help as well. And so so that began a journey that was, for the most part, very um, positive. But unfortunately, it it wasn't long before his cycles just returned. Mm, mm-hmm. You know, everything in a marriage, I think our kids pick up on or notice or are affected by, even though we might try right. not to let them know. Do you think that your kids mm-hmm. knew there was some of this going on or knew there was something under the surface? I don't know. And I, I'm not sure they did bec- just because... It was all they had ever seen. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not like they saw a change in our relationship. I still spoke to him. Mm-hmm. You know, I still you weren't like fighting spoke, or I, right. I wasn't fighting with him. I still spoke to him um, respectfully and so on. And uh, we still went places and uh, vacationed and things like that. Mm-hmm. So, um, so they they. Because because when you're a child, you tend to think whatever you're experiencing is mm-hmm. how families are, <laughs> right? And, and so on. I do not think at that stage or age they um, knew there was anything wrong. Mm-hmm. But once once we started um, actually getting help, then yes, because mm-hmm. then suddenly there's all this counseling, there's all these appointments, there's all these. There was a, a lot of upheaval. Uh, we moved and, and to become to get closer to this uh, this help and so on. So um, at that point, they we had to tell them some things. Yeah, and and that language was whatever language the counselor told us to, to use for mm-hmm. age appropriate at that time was what mm-hmm. we used. Sure. Mm-hmm. So Jane, after the intensive counseling, um, you said the. The patterns returned. So what were the next steps? So at that time, because I had had counseling in groups too, I was in a much healthier place of not having to carry the burden of, of the secrets and, and the weight of, of all of that and having um, people I could go to and you know process with and ask questions and get help. And as the as the patterns continued, because we were in this community, this Christian community, my husband was confronted by the other men. Several of the other men confronted him one on one, and even um, in front of me about his repeated uh, behaviors, and uh, you know, trying to warn him the dangers there and and how he was ruining the marriage. Yeah, there were promises made. We separated for a short while. There were um, promises made. We got back together after about six months. And before long, the patterns continued. (laughs) So once those patterns returned, that separation was so hard. It was so hard on 
my children uh, and on me just watching my children grieve. I really did not want to do that again. Mm -hmm. Um, So even though the pattern was there, you know, I just used my, the, the support resources I had to endure. Um, But as time goes on, thing sin doesn't stay the same. (laughs) It gets worse. And those patterns eventually caused him to lose his job. Even though we were returning to counseling, there was no change whatsoever. And and you could just see that and, and the level of, um, of living with like a, a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde kind of situation was off the charts. Uh, we would be in counseling and he would sound one way. We would leave the counseling office and it was 100% of flip back. Mm. The last straw was when he lost his job and would not even look for work. I had already said, you know, I'm really on the verge of divorce here. I really don't want to do this. I really need you to wake up and take this seriously. I need you to, you know, to take the steps and, and you are, you are the one in control of the destiny here. I've, I've done everything I can do. I'm willing to do more. Like I'm in, I'm in a hundred percent, but I can't, I can't carry this a hundred percent. It's a, it's, you've got to do your part. And, uh, he could not seem to do that in counseling. And then he would not even look for a job. And when that happened, I said, I'm, I'm filing for divorce. I cannot bear the weight of this and carrying the family financially is too much. Mm-hmm. So, um, that, that is, must that be is a how, very daunting decision though, to say, which is the harder choice living with that or right. living on your own without him. I mean, I think that right. would be a very difficult choice. It was a, definitely a, a very difficult choice. I feel like the, the Lord really kind of made it for me through my husband's lack of even effort at getting a job. It, it really closed every door because obviously it's easier for me to financially provide for me and my child than it is to provide for me, my child and my husband. Right. So, um, and at this point, your older two were out of the house. They were out of the house, yes. Mm-hmm. And um, so it 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 was not an easy decision. Obviously, it was a deci- decision that I uh, grieved and still grieve. Mm-hmm. Um, right. I mean, it's just you as a believer, you really you don't get married to divorce. You know, you marry to live together and, and to and to love one another and cherish one another and even though that's not every day perfect um that's that's the end goal it was yeah it was not an easy decision well jane you mentioned you were married for a total of 29 years and within the first year of marriage you found this out and started praying for your husband fervently at that point and it sounds like for the majority of your marriage you were alone um, praying, begging God for help, um, in your isolated situation. Praise the Lord. He brought you the support later on, I guess what, after 17 years. Um, but did you struggle then with any bitterness towards the Lord for not healing this for not, Mm -hmm. I, I just, I can see you on your knees begging for the life of your husband, begging for the love of your husband. And I just, can you describe how you came to terms with your prayers, um, not fully being answered? (laughs) Right. Um, that it was definitely a struggle. I mean, I did not understand why God would not change his heart marriage is a good thing and you want our marriage to be right. So why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you do that, God? Why wouldn't you do that? Coming to terms with that was more about recognizing that, yes, God, God is always for us. He is always for redemption. He is always for um, restoration. And he is willing to do that even now for my husband. But the other party, us, we have to be willing to do that, to let go of our sin and, and to, um, to let that go and move on. And my husband wasn't, was not willing to do that. 
I, I still pray, not probably not like I, I did then, because yes, there, I was just, there was a, so many tears and I still pray with tears that, that he would repent because I believe very much for him, it matters. It matters for him. It matters for my 12 year old and it matters for his adult children. Now, I don't know where he is and, you know, I do not get in his business and I don't try to find that out and I just can't, I can't carry that. So, Mm -hmm. um, but I do pray for him just as well. Can you give us a picture of what your life currently looks like? What my life currently looks like. (laughs) Um, My life currently looks like uh, working nine to five, uh, five days a week. My child, my 12 year old is in in public school. It's just the two of us at home, whatever that. (laughs) It could be a little lonely with a 12 year old boy. (laughs) It, it can be. And I think for him, too, he gets a little lonely with just <laughs> just having me around. And so thankfully, he has friends and I have friends. Um, so that helps. I can remember when I first divorced, getting, you know, my own place and, and finding a job and um, and working nine to five. I had not worked um, full time since probably I was in high school or <laughs> between mm-hmm. high school and college. Wow. Or right after, well, right after college. Right. right after college would have been the last time when my husband was a- attending seminary. That would have been the last time I was working full time. And so going to full time and trying to manage uh, the house, even just with one child, was very overwhelming to me. Mm-hmm. And uh, just a lot of lot of grief. It was a it was a very big year of grieving uh, all of that. And but now, I mean, it's, I've, you know, come to more of a place of acceptance about it and just thankful that God has provided for me through a job and provided friends and teachers at school that have been good influences and that my son influences them as well. Like Mm -hmm. it's just, um, it's very strong personality. (laughs) Yeah. And so he shares his beliefs. He is not afraid to speak up and he is not afraid to ask his teachers like, why, why do we say that? Why do we do that? (laughs) Uh So, so those things are really encouraging. I don't, I don't know what the future holds. Um, but I I really do. I really do live one day at a time. Mm -hmm. I, I have to, I just, it's too much for me Mm -hmm. to think beyond like, what do I need to do today? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being vulnerable. You know, even just hearing that you have struggled, have continued to struggle, but you're learning, like, just that's real life. I mean, you had to change your life completely. And it's not like a movie where by the time the credits roll, you have it all figured out, you know? (laughs) Right, right. No, it is not. It is not. And everything in our Christian life, it just turns our eyes, all, all the different types of suffering, whether we're losing a loved one or um, divorcing or just, you know, painful circumstances with children or whatever. It's all just turning our eyes to, this is not really my home. This cannot be mm-hmm. my home. This is, this is not all there is. You know, I have a hope. It is an eternal hope. It is an eternal home. And just that longing, that longing for heaven. When I was in my 20s, I used to think, like, how did those people even, like, think about heaven all the time? Right. (laughs) But as you grow as a believer and and as you go through pain, every pain just turns you more and more to this is not, this is not my eternal home. Mm -hmm. Amen. (laughs) Well, I know that one of the things that you can probably speak to is how can people in the church or how can friends appropriately help others that we know in these kinds of situations? Like maybe what don't you say or what don't you do? Yeah. So probably the best encouragers are always those who have um, had at least somewhat of a similar experience, even if it's not the exact same, you know, other women who have perhaps whose husbands have um, been unfaithful 
uh, whether through porn or not, uh, can still relate to mm-hmm. that um, those same feelings of rejection and and betrayal. Yes, and, but anyone can anyone can comfort. I was, you know, I was reading in is it Second Corinthians this morning about you know we comfort with the comfort we have received. And Mm -hmm. meaning that we can comfort people in all kinds of circumstances because we've received comfort. And so you can comfort people even if you haven't been in that situation. Mm -hmm. And the thing that will prevent you from saying something (laughs) or that's not helpful, right, is just really empathizing and putting yourself in that situation and imagining what that might be like and feel like the other verses I was reading this morning was just about how God is, you know, close to the brokenhearted and and saves those who are crushed in spirit and, and how he comforts us um, and how he comes along and encourages us. So I think um, encouragement and comfort are very closely related and that we're all able to do those, but certainly when you go through something and someone else has been down a similar road, that comfort is, is stronger it, because, mm-hmm. I mean, that's why Jesus came, right? Because mm-hmm, right. he can say, I know everything you've gone through. I understand it. What are some steps that women in these situations can take and what do they need to consider in deciding which steps to take? Like, what are some things, okay. what are some factors to, t- to keep in mind? Yeah, I would say um, if I could go back and redo, I would um, I would reach out to someone. When I think about those 17 years when I was only praying and not telling anyone, I know that God did give me people that I could have told, that I could have reached out to, that I could have shared with, but I was too afraid to do that. Mm. And there were, you know, the, I can think of very specific people that at certain times that I'm like, that would have been, that, that that's a perfect opportunity right there. Mm-hmm. Um, and But fear kept me from doing that. And so I would just say, reach out to someone trustworthy, you know, someone who you see that can keep a confidence. Um, and even if, Even if they have not been there and don't know exactly what to do, um, they will probably have the wisdom to be able to encourage you and maybe direct you to someone who can connect you with help. What about people with small children? I mean, do you feel like you could have done this while you still had three young kids at home? Like, I think sometimes it can feel overwhelming to think about like feeling trapped, like you have no other option. What would what would you say to someone who feels maybe trapped in the physical situation as in they couldn't provide for themselves or don't have a place to go or don't have a lot of outside support? What would you say that they could do to make it better? Right, right. So every circumstance being different, if we're talking about someone who um, whose spouse is not taking any initiative over the struggle, they're not seeking counseling, they're not really interested in, in changing, and that person wants to get out but doesn't see a way because of the finances. That, I mean, that's a, that's a, real, that's a real thing. It's a, it's a real thing. I would advise finding a job finding even just a, even a part-time job. If you're, you know, if you have kids at home, um, if they're not old enough to, um, be in school yet, maybe when they get to pre-K using the public school and getting a job, even if it's part-time and building your skill set. There are work from home jobs, but obviously work from home jobs, you still have to have quiet and time to yourself. You can't really do work from home with two-year-olds and three-year-olds running around your <laughs> legs mm-hmm. so and, and taking care of them. So just planning, making a plan for how can I provide for myself? If there's not a support, if there's not, I can't go um, live with my aunt or my mom and dad or um, this friend or whatever until I get on my feet, then, 
you have to think about how you can do that. Little steps, I guess. Just from talking with my other friend and just like trying to hear her talk about her husband's response, like what she wanted him to do. Like the best indicator of success, I believe, is that your husband will do whatever it takes. Yes. What yeah. does the whatever look like? Like give us some examples of what you would want to see. Like like you right. mentioned earlier, getting rid of cable. Is there anything else? Right. Um, yeah, I I think you're right, Julie. I think that willingness, what does real repentance, what does mm-hmm. real repentance look like? Um, one, it means admitting, right, and agreeing with God. So admitting that there's a wrong, that that what you've done is wrong, and then being able to empathize with the pain of the person you've hurt and and being able to own that and, and take responsibility for that. And then being willing to take steps, like whatever steps are needed. Do I, do I need to, um, you know, do you need to be able to pick up my phone anytime you want? Um, Mm -hmm. if that's Mm -hmm. been a, if that's been an issue or, or do I need to not be on the internet at all? Mm -hmm. Um, that seems crazy in our world, right? Because so many, everything, Mm -hmm. (laughs) everything we do is on the internet. But if that is your right hand that's offending you, right, Mm -hmm. as Jesus said, and specifically related to porn, because the word there is pornania, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, you know, so that willingness, even if that's not the step that is taken, if that willingness to do whatever is necessary says everything. And and yeah, true repentance means you see change, right? You see change, not just the words, not just the initial, not just the initial tears. Um, You know, we see this so much in, in churches when, when someone falls, whether it's a sexual fall or a, or they've stolen money or whatever, we see the tearful so-called repentance and Mm then no consequences, (laughs) at all Mm -hmm. and no expectation of consequences or change from the parishioners, you know, just of, oh, well, it's forgiven. Yes. Forgiven is great. Forgiven is very good. Let's forgive. But that doesn't mean that you've earned trust Mm -hmm. to, to have access to the finances again, if you've been stealing, right. Mm -hmm. Um, Right. You wouldn't, you don't put the fox in charge of the hen house. So if Mm -hmm. if there's a problem there, then that willingness to accept those limitations because you've broken those, that trust, because you've betrayed that trust and not, um, not feeling entitled to, to coming back to that without earning the trust. Sure. Yeah, I think those are good things to hear if that might maybe help someone prevent that cycle you were talking about, like mm-hmm. what to look for, what to expect from someone who is really truly repentant. Right. I think in in my um in my life I was very it was very hard for me because for one thing I was never seeing what was going on. I was only, you know, hearing the report, but over time as I through counseling and through support groups and through just God, I began to trust what God was saying to me. And when I would know there is something going on here, I would have that gut, which I had Mm -hmm. had, but I had learned to turn that off and Mm -hmm. ignore that and push that down. And so one of the great things I got from counseling was learning to listen to that. Mm -hmm. And I, I could, I could, I knew even, even before we divorced, I was confronting my husband every, almost every week saying, is there something going on? Because Mm -hmm. I'm sensing there is something really amiss here. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm seeing, I'm seeing you on your computer all the time. I'm seeing you isolating a lot. I'm seeing you be really crabby and weird. You know, I'm seeing things and I'm experiencing things. What is going on? And he would lie to me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I, I 
wouldn't say I accepted the lies, but that there was nothing I could, you know. You recognized I, it, though. I recognized. I believed my gut, but all I could do was wait until God revealed. Mm-hmm. And so then God revealed. Yeah. Well, Jane, I, I know I just so appreciate you being open and honest and vulnerable with us today. Is there any encouragement, any words that you would like to leave our listeners with to kind of sum up your journey? Uh, Yes. Thank you. (laughs) I would say that God is always for the oppressed. He is always for the hurting. He is always for the brokenhearted. And our God is righteous and holy and cares about justice. And lots of times when you're on the um, receiving end of hurt again and again and again, um, it can be easy to become bitter and angry, even if you don't become bitter and angry at God, at the person who is harming you. But God is able to use that pain, even all the pain, that I have been through with even all those years of, of praying, God used that. God used that to teach me to pray. God used that to teach me to use the resources that I did have and to focus on the things that I could do. God used that. Later, when I looked back to be able to say, hey, I can even see where he was providing more than I took advantage of. Um, so he never leaves our side. He cares. He loves, loves us so much, so much more than we understand so much more than we give him credit for. Um, so I would just say, if you feel alone and stuck and isolated in this, ask God to show you someone that you can talk to and take the risk and, and talk to someone. The first time I went into a support group to talk about this was very crazy, <laughs> crazy healing because um, I had a lot of years to pour out. Mm-hmm. So um, don't wait, to, don't hold up 17 years. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Uh, or 15 years or 10 years, find someone now that you can talk to who can at least encourage you and, and pray Mm -hmm. um, for other resources. Counseling is so much better today. There's so much, I mean, there's so much more available counseling wise. It's just incredible to take advantage. Jane, I know that not every listener is dealing with this, but as we said before, If you have a son, it's something that we really need to be talking about with our sons, but it feels like such an awkward subject to broach. Do you have any advice for moms in this area? Yeah, that's, (laughs) that is a challenge. Um, I, I have personally asked other men to speak to my son. Oh, that's a good idea. Because I do feel like it's a, I do feel like it's an awkward conversation for me to have as a woman. Mm-hmm. And as his mom with him. Now I have told him, we've talked indirectly about it because I've talked about, you know, the dangers of the internet and how everything is available and you will, you can be doing something innocently and other things come to you. So I've had indirect conversations about those kinds of things and why I use a filter and, um, and why different things I do. And told him, you know, you can come to me, you can tell me. And then I've also said, and you can tell, you know, this, this person, and you can tell your older brother, and you Mm -hmm. can tell, um, so trustworthy men um, that know and understand the challenge there that Mm -hmm. you would, that you would trust speaking to your son, Mm -hmm. um, definitely take advantage because it is, it is an awkward thing, not just for the mom, but obviously for the son. <laughs> right, right. Right. But necessary. Like but not necessary, avoiding yes. it isn't going to make it not, not come it. around. No. Right. 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 Yeah. If, I mean, if 
push came to shove and there was no man that I could say that to that that would broach that subject I I would just I would do it. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, because you you know, it has to be it has to be has to be talked about. Yes. Shining a light on things that we tend to do in secret is a good thing. You know, right. shining the light and right. even if you say, mm-hmm. "Hey, I'm aware that this is out there. I'm aware that you could be doing this. I'm aware that you did this." Like it just takes some of the mystery away and allows you to have more input on it and hopefully yes. can lead to yeah, some and the more shame. conversations. Yeah. And the shame takes the shame away. And that just knowing I have someone to trust that I can talk to about it, that's not going to condemn me or in my relationship right. over, right. you know, I right. think that, yeah, that's spring. There's a couple of books that I would love for us to link with this episode And for any men that happen to see this topic and listen, there's a book called Every Man's Battle that is excellent. And it's written by a man that struggled with pornography for men in a language that speaks very well to men um, by Stephen. Should I even say the author? Arterburn. 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 Yes. And then there's Preparing Your Son for Every Man's Battle. And that is a book that if your husband is willing, can lead your sons through. And it's dealing with this particular topic, and it's very, very excellent. Mm, Those are good. Yeah. Tim Chalice has a blog, and he often will hit on this topic. He he just writes book reviews and other, From he's a believer, um, but he often hits on pornography. And he has some good info on there about that. He has one blog that he wrote a couple of Christmases ago, I think, called Don't Give Your Child Porn for Christmas. Mm. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, or Please Don't Give Them Porn for Christmas, something like that. It, it's very good. Um, there's a book called Wired for Intimacy by William Struthers, and it talks about um, it, he's a believer as well, and he's writing about how pornography hijacks the male brain how our, our his brain our brains and the male brain is de- designed for intimacy god designed us to know one another but how porn how porn is very deceptive with that and mm-hmm. sort of takes over right okay well we'll link to these books and other resources in our show notes uh jane's also gonna email me some other things that have been helpful for her so listeners if you would like to receive our show notes in your email box Put show notes in the subject line and email us at midlifematterspodcast at gmail.com. Or you can always go to our website to see the show notes at midlifematterspodcast.com. Again, thank you so much for coming on today, Jane, and being so vulnerable and sharing your experiences. I know that there are going to be people listening today that are very helped by what they've heard you say. Yes, thank you so much. You're so welcome. It's my pleasure. Thank y'all for having me. I really appreciate it. Yes. Absolutely. All right, Mindy and Julie, we will talk to you next week. Sounds great. Bye, Bye, girls. We'll talk to you later. We're so happy you joined us today. You can find the show notes for this episode at midlifematterspodcast.com. Also, please tell a friend about the show and help them hit the free subscribe button on their favorite podcast app. Be sure to follow us on Instagram at Midlife Matters Podcast. That's where we post pictures and stories about all the things we talk about in each episode. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week.